right for those of you who actually recognize the theme music and there may be some of you out there who do welcome back to civil tension the civil tension podcast uh, after our about six month break 90 episodes in we're coming back with episode 91 the first episode of 2020 the election year and we have with us here in the studio today uh, we've got with us Ryan Yantis, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan Yantis, and we have Congressional Candidate, Republican for Congress, Jim, James, Jim Martyr. So, fellas, say hello to everybody out there. Howdy. Hello, folks. Right. Awesome. And uh, today on Civil Tension, the first one back, because this has been the absolute hot topic of, wow, <laughs> for for several months now. Uh, we got impeachment on the plate. So, uh, you know, a plate full of peaches. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and generally what we do on Civil Tension, I know the two of you have not been on an episode in the past. I moderate. I throw out that topic. And all I want to do is really just hear about what you think, where your thoughts are. Uh, and you can you can assign them to uh, our, our president. You can assign them to his opposition. You can assign them to anybody in the process. Or if there's something else that comes to mind that you feel like, but you know what? This is a little bit more important to me right now than impeachment because I'll tell you where I stand. It's kind of stupid. Uh, to me, this whole process has been an, a monumental, in one way, a monumental waste of time. In another way, an invaluable uh, introspective to a group of people in our country and how they feel about the good old that's US right. of A. Uh, that's that's how I, I that's right. so I'm a little torn. In one way, I think it's been incredibly valuable. In another way, uh, man, I'm just so irritated that my tax dollars are being spent on this. And by the way, I am uh, Pete, Pete Galt. I'm the, the host and moderator and creator of Civil Tension. So um, which one of you feel like uh, you, you have something to say first? Oh, I, I do. I always you, have you, something to ready. say. You always have I'm something to, to say. All right. Well, Jim, uh, share your thoughts. Go All right. All right. Look, it's a sham impeachment. It's, as you said, look, it's a monumental waste of time, colossal waste of taxpayer money. Um, but but it is insightful in that now you get to see the left really and the socialist radical left unveiled for who they really are. Um, you've got a perfectly legitimate phone call between a president and leaders of, of foreign countries who were giving bill, millions, if not billions, of dollars to in defense, and, and we ought to check the check the credentials and say, hey, what's going on here? What are you going to do this? Are you guys really with us or not? Um, that's what we that's what we want in a president. We want them to be on spot on a, saying, look, if you got some corruption going on here, we got to know about it. Uh, the flip side of it is there's no evidence of any wrongdoing. There's no uh, allegation of a crime. Um, no one cited any uh, U.S. law that's being broken here. And they brought him up on impeachment charges and they want to run a fake sham trial in the Senate. And then the House wants to dictate to the Senate how to do it. I mean, you couldn't put a crazier script together, uh, but like you said, very insightful because now we get to see them fully for who they are. It, yeah. Yeah, I look at this as uh, an incredible waste uh, of time, money, and karma. And the many in opposition to the president uh, have been angling to impeach him since before he was even sworn into office. Um, and the Trump derangement syndrome is alive and well. Uh, and if this was the best they could do, it's some of the worst political theater that's ever been produced. Um, with, with Mr. Uh, Schiff uh, running his uh, theater of the hypothetical, uh, just totally ludicrous. And I used to have a sign above my desk in the Pentagon that said, can you imagine a world without hypothetical situations? And uh, that that's a classic example of just the overreach and the panic that they have that they're not accomplishing what they need to accomplish uh, in the midst of a uh, presidential primary. It, it's flawed. It's screwed up. Do you think, though, because here's here's kind of what ran through my head a little bit is while this is and I right now I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you both. Uh, so we have no tension yes. in the room other than nationally. We've got the tension here on this. Uh, but 
do you suppose that's kind of on purpose? I mean, look at the timing of this. It, it, this uh, we're leading into 2020, the, the presidential primary. Is the goal to tie things up so much so that uh, maybe they're hoping he has an ineffectual run? Is that, I mean, strategically on their part, on their part is, it's does it, that even make sense? Well, it's interesting because you have four senators who are also uh, political opposition candidates that are running against. Now, they're supposed to sit in solemn judgment of the president in impeachment. No, they're not unbiased. Uh, but meanwhile, they are not out campaigning in Iowa on a very critical primary. Right. And I know the primary is a caucus, but it's still the first. And uh, is that to enable Mr. Uh, Biden to have a clear running field without any real opposition for the last week going in? And the timing on that is very suspect. But we've seen the DNC ex have very Machiavellian tactics to marginalize the non-establishment uh, uh, players in their party getting in front of the electorate. So. Who knows what the Democrats are doing? Um, it's it's the theater of the absurd. Yeah, the, you know, you know, and exactly, and that's a great point, uh, Ryan. Um, the other thing is, look, uh, Nancy Pelosi. They they voted on impeachment back in December. Held on to the articles for forty days. I mean, this unprecedented. It's really weird. It's like, and then they wanted to tell the Senate, dictate to the Senate how to run the trial. I mean, it's amazing. So um, there's, there's a lot of timing elements to it. And the Democrats held this thing up, you know, for four years. Oh, and, and Ryan, you also mentioned they wanted to do it before um, he even was, was uh, sworn into office. And that was Lauren Underwood. She's on record as saying she wanted, she wanted impeachment of president. How do you impeach a president for doing something when he ha actually hasn't been sworn in yet? So they've been on this, this ban. I mean, and there was, there was like 40, 50 of them, maybe more of the Democrats, maybe all of them, I don't know. But there was a bunch of them. And they were on this before he got, he even got sworn in. I was there at the inauguration, January 20th, 2017, and uh, they were already on that bandwagon. But it's well, all, yeah. the only other time in history that I can think of uh, is back in 1860, after uh, Lincoln became president-elect, Buchanan was still the sitting president, and you had uh, a handful of southern states do their articles of succession yeah and by hook and by crook and fairness and foul they seceded from the union and they cited it's because lincoln's president well he wasn't even the president then right and right. buchanan failed in his executive oath uh to support and defend the constitution um yes. so it, it's very interesting and uh yeah, the Democrats, the Democratic Party was on the wrong side of history in the 1860s. And in many ways, I see them being the wrong side of history now. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's like, uh, it's a great point. I mean, you bring up history, you look at history, and there's so much repeating, right? And, and we need to be students of history and learn from it, because otherwise, we are doomed to repeat it. And, and that's, that's just a great point, you know. Um, the, what's going on in Washington today, it, it's crazy, but look, it's almost always been like that. When, when I started reading about our founding and our history, and you find out there's all this contention, it's always been there, and everyone pretends like this is new. It's never happened like this before, but it's always been there ever since our founding. And, I, and you know, I think that's the great thing about our system in, in America. It's like we have the opportunity to debate this, to fight it. Let's, let's get, you know, let's you know, open up our knuckles and get down and not <laughs> knock down, drag out on this thing, right? Well, it, it is, and you're right. And the history that uh, it, what I've discovered, because I've even talked with my kids who are now all young adults, my youngest is 21. Uh, but even when they were in high school, um, the history on just our civil war was not taught. It was, oh yeah, we had one next. And, but why? What the heck? What was it about? What, what caused this enormous amount of death and destruction to a young nation at that point in time? Uh, there was literally no... When, I think when we were... I grew up in Missouri. And when I was in eighth grade, in order to get out of the eighth grade, you had to take uh, the government test. The, 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 this, the civil test, the test that... Oh, 
what the heck was it? It was about the Constitution. It was about the, yeah. the, the, the structure of the government. It was about uh, also included a state section for Missouri, where I grew up. If you didn't pass that, and passing was a 75, it wasn't a high score, but right, if you didn't right. get at least 75, you didn't leave the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as that anymore, right. from what I understand. Well, uh, and, and, you know, yeah, I, my daughters are younger. Uh, the youngest is 17. Uh, and there is still in Illinois school system, they still have to identify the states and they still have civics as part of middle school where it's the ubiquitous, everybody hop on the bus and go to Springfield for an overnight trip. Uh, so there, there are uh, differing ways of, of uh, educating people. Part of the problem with, uh, and I'm a historian by training, that's my college degree, that's my passion uh, as far as academic, but uh, the vast majority of people who teach history, uh, frankly, suck at it. And they're, they're passionate about their one area and don't look at it in a holistic view. And uh, that's part of the problem of moving away from the classics in education, of teaching people how to think versus creating technocrats and teaching them what to do. Right. And we've moved in education to an education system based on technocrats. Mm. Yeah, amen to that. Look, I, I was more of a math science guy. I wanted to be a chemical engineer, ended up as in, uh, in industrial management and, and computer science, and that's what I do for a living, but I get to work with all the the, the engineers and, and scientists and, and uh, production folks and manufacturing companies around, but we're not teaching all this stuff anymore. I, I have a, uh, a, a young, uh, high school intern that's, that's volunteering on my campaign, but she's also happens to be the chair of the Oswego Republican Club. Imagine that, it's two years, two years new, so it's a great organization in their school. And she was telling me about her AP history class not too long ago. She said their AP history teacher told the class that the Constitution was created by a bunch of old white guys. And I was like, well, that's pretty interesting because if you, they were old when they died, but if you look at half of them at the age of the time they wrote it, they actually weren't old then. But, you know, it's the bias that you're talking about, the bias that has crept in through uh, all the way through our public school system from K, K to 12. And, well, you know, the old white guy is a pithy little thing yeah. to hang the hat on and yeah. to uh, alienate people from the Constitution. Right. Uh, it is a very impressive document given what the, the structures of the time were. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. you know, okay, we all have to listen to this one person because God told us that he's our king. Really? Uh, and and the, the founding fathers said, no, we have a better way of doing this. No. And you, well, okay. Let me just say hello to a couple of people because sure. man, so much is swimming in my head. That's but all right. <laughs> and, and, but uh, I want to say uh, hello out there to Ross. Thanks for joining and tuning in and watching with us. And Glenn Smith, good morning. Good to see you uh, tune in there. Ross, Glenn, anybody else that comes and hangs out with us, feel free to pop in comments, questions, anything you'd like to add, uh, or if you've got uh, questions that uh, uh, you would like uh, Ryan or Jim uh, to field or what have you. We're talking about, uh, well, government impeachment and uh, the just the ridicularity of it all. Ridicularity is my new word of the day. It's, I'll, I'll take poetic license for that. I don't know if it's an actual word. I, I just used it, so it, now it is. So <laughs> we'll go with that. But on this, you, you talk about the history and where it comes from, and, and it drives me nuts when people say, oh, the Constitution was written by a bunch of old white dudes. But as you pointed out, Jim, those dudes were very young when they put that together. Yeah, many of this, them, yeah. Relatively, yeah. Yeah, the, relatively. I mean, they were all, uh, what, somewhere between their 30s, 40s, and, I, and I'd say that now as a much older fellow, but they were relatively young mm -hmm. for, quote, unquote, very poli politically active right. and very – uh, very much aware of the type of society that they they wanted and needed to live in and coming out of a monarchy coming out of uh, I mean you, you say oh it's a bunch of old white dudes you know what those old white dudes did is they left a country that was ruled you were not a that's citizen right. that's right you are not a citizen you are a subject mm -hmm. and to a certain extent that is still the case that's right uh, they while while the you know the UK Britain England has come a long long way since then in their own structure, uh, 
none of these other countries have what we have here in the United States. And when, when I hear people talking about needing a safe space, guess what those old white dudes did with that constitution? They created the largest safe space that exists in the entire world. That's amen to that. Well, and one pushback point. Our, our first version of government was a confederacy. Yeah. So you had the Articles of Confederation. Yeah. So that was Independence 1.0. Right. Yeah. Then they found out that that was not a sustainable long-term structure and had the Constitutional Convention to create the, the Constitution 2.0, which creates our current uh, representative uh, republic democracy. And I, it's a republic. I, I, yeah, I start foaming at the mouth when right, I hear politicians right. saying, we live in a democracy. No, we don't. We don't. Right. We don't. You are absolutely good. We live in, we live in a, a constitutional republic. Yes. And, and I'm very thankful for that. Now, we use a democratic process right, right. within that. Yes. But we are not. You're absolutely right. We are not a democracy. And it does, like, like you, it drives me absolutely nuts right. when right. I hear that. Now, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, look, and you look at the what what the founders were facing back in those times, right? If you start start reading, and I'm just a, I would say I'm a relatively new student at history, you know, my and my adult, you know, life from my 30s on. But as you start reading and understanding what was going on, um, a lot of those founders died in the process. We don't know about as many of them as the names that everyone knows because there were you know, they were putting their lives on the line to stand up to that, the king, the, the you know, the dictator, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, they put their lives, sacred for, fortunes and honor on the line. And, and you know, th this, this was, uh, they were all put, risking everything they had. So, so to, you know, to try to trivialize that and say, oh, it's a bunch of old, rich, white guys, whatever, it, it's not the same thing. And then I, I read a book um, of the writings of Thomas Jefferson. And, in that, he has a lot of letters back and forth to Abigail Adams. So you talk about, you know, what was the influence of women during that time? And guess what? It, it, was, it was big, but you don't, you don't know how this, this happened if you're not reading the history and studying what's going on. I mean, there were, there, were, there were spheres of influence all around, which also included a lot of the founding women, and we don't hear about that as much as we should, right? Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> and, and one of the interesting things, now here's, here's what, to an extent, I'm happy for it, and on another side, it bothers me. But I don't know if either of you have ever heard of, uh, there are two shows. One I just discovered last night, uh, uh, but uh, two shows, Drunk History, which is on, uh, I think that's a Comedy Central show. And that show was actually introduced to me way back when my daughter was still in high school. And the, the teacher used that as educational information. Now... The information presented in the in the shows, and actually all of them I've watched, is accurate. Mm -hmm. They actually do a pretty good job of presenting actual history in, in a very comedic format. And we had to sign a permission slip. That's how I learned about the thing. Because it's all about, you know, comedians and other people talking about our history as a country while getting toasted. You know, they're, they're sitting there drinking whatever. So that's why they call it drunk history. And it is comical but it's accurate. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I appreciate this. Last night I discovered a show my well, my wife discovered it and said, here, you know, let's watch this. I had a couple of really young guys that we've watched on another show and it called Ruined History. Similar idea, similar thought produced by another group of people. Now I'm really not gonna give too much credit for it. if you want to watch or learn about ruined history, just go Google it, watch it. It's out there. I think it's on Hulu or uh I don't think it's, I think it's Hulu, might be Amazon, I'm not sure which. Um, watch it. it. But it also, very, very accurate, but they do it in a panel forum. And it's, it's all very young people. I don't think anyone on there might, might be right around, I think the oldest on there might be right around their early 30s, maybe. Other than that, very, very young folks. Uh, but uh, they do actually do a good job while 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 very comical and very ridiculous they do it they did a very very good job and that's it's a really early world history they they cover all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. um that our kids have to learn accurate history from comedy central and other internet shows really bothers me I, it, it does oh yeah come on guys what 
what the hell you know what well i'm going to go back to an earlier statement is you know there are a lot of history teachers out there that really suck at teaching history and if you can't make it engaging and informative and inspirational um then you're not a good history teacher uh, and putting things in people's hands or letting them take a different riff and a different view of history is not a bad thing so uh, if, if they're getting excited about history and interested in history from uh, a humor-based show, that's great. I'd rather that, that be their their impetus to get started. Um, when I ran the Pritzker Military Library in downtown Chicago, a uh, great facility, a uh, great organization, my IT guy was Troy. And Troy was your, your just typical, stereotypical IT guy. Pale white skin, had never seen sunshine. Um, I don't think he had read a book for pleasure since uh, Cat in the Hat in the third grade. <laughs> okay. And he, he came in one day and he was very excited about this war game that he had found online and it was called Enemy at the Gates. And having been a war gamer and a military guy, I talked to him because I thought it was neat that he was excited about it. And then I pointed out, by the way, Troy, here's this book. It's called Enemy at the Gates and that's what that war game is based off of. And it's the battle for Stalingrad. Wow. Next thing I know, Troy is grabbing the book off the shelf, and a couple of days later comes in. He goes, I read this. This was a fantastic. This was so neat. And great. If Troy got excited about history from playing a war game, that's the important part. Yeah. Um, and if he read about it, that's even better. And if he keeps being excited about it, that's even better. You know, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that you came back to my dismay. Uh, with that because I wasn't seeing that part of it. I, I, I was seeing the frustration of why don't they get this in school? Yeah, but you're yeah, right. Yeah. If, they're, if they're brought to actual history and it's real, it's true, it's accurate, yep. it's, it's good history, nothing made up, then I am all, I'll, I'll join you on that. Well, in, in academia um, and the Civil War in American history has been an interest of mine. Um, and I've had learned discussions with smart folks and, and law school graduates. And it wasn't until I ran into a telephone repairman in the Pentagon, and I just overheard him talking about the legality of secession. And he was from Virginia, so he had that Virginia drawl. And I'm listening to him talk, and the people around him are going, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. And I had to stick my nose in and say, you know, that's a load of crap. Mm. And Red looked at me and he goes, okay, so show me in the Constitution where it's not allowed. And that started about a 16-month running gun battle discussion that was kind of like you know, yeah, civil yeah. tension there where we were friendly and we were trying to inform each other and argue. And uh, we went back through the, the articles of the, the Constitution. We went through the Articles of Confederation, which preceded it, the uh, Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers, various things. And finally, the end result was, Red, take a look at this Northwest Ordinance, the the uh, document which creates the northern tier states of Illinois and Wisconsin and whatnot. And what it said is at the same time as the Constitution was being drafted and ratified, Northwest Ordinance, if you want to join the United States, understand it's a permanent union. Once you're in, you're never out. So if Congress was doing that to the new states, it was applied to the other states as well. So uh, secession was never legal no. and it was illegally done by the southern states in many ways uh but i learned a hell of a lot from a te telephone repairman <laughs> there you go in the pentagon <laughs> that i had never had that discussion academically or with the, the smart people wow and yeah. you know, red and i are still friends he's a great guy yeah that's awesome that's yeah awesome. you know i i love that story it's um and i get to meet people from all around the world and by, and by the way uh, I might resemble your IT guy description. I am an IT guy, <laughs> although I, I was never big into the video. I mean, I'm an old school IT guy, but but look, I work with people from all over the all over the world, from from Mumbai to Shanghai to Brazil, Sao Paulo, mm -hmm. Central America, Europe. I mean, there's IT guys and gals from from all over the world, and and we work together on a, on a daily basis. So so I would challenge your uh, stereotypical. <laughs> Description. Maybe the millennial IT guy you got down. <laughs> well, this was 2006. Uh, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> so a few years ago. Yeah, 13. So, okay. All right. Now, 
what I would like to do, we're actually almost right up to um, the 10 o'clock hour. we got a couple of minutes before we get there. Uh, I, I want to actually just share a little bit uh, with everybody who's uh, listening in right now about our guests. We've got Ryan Yantis, uh, who is the uh, president of Silverleaf Leadership Communication, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army veteran, and a Pentagon 9-11 survivor. And uh, then we also have with us uh, James T. Jim Martyr, Jim Martyr, uh, who is a Republican for Congress. He's running for Congress. And uh, so we're actually really excited to have you both here. Thank you both for joining me. This is really cool. I know we had uh, a handful of people scheduled for today, and I know this is a return, and we had kind of a slickery morning starting off here. Bit, yeah. uh, so we had a little bit of a change. And uh, what I would like to do, since we're missing, um, you know, four people that we had thought about is, you know, with the return of civil tension, what we've agreed is that uh, while you, you know, folks do, uh, you know, pay 20 bucks for a seat at the table, uh, you actually are going to get to get the minutes of the folks that are not here today. Uh, so, because uh, I set aside six minutes for that. And so uh, each one of you are going to get three minutes instead of just the one. And you can tell us anything you want to tell us. It's at your spot to, to say anything you want to share. I don't care what it's about, so long as it is legal, folks. No, no, uh, no, no selling no the drugs. No, no, yeah. Nothing illegal yeah. or moral yeah. or fattening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, fattening, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm not on camera, so people can't see that I'm That's a big right. round fella. Right. Uh, but uh, I'm not opposed to fattening. But the other, the other three, yeah, let, let's get those off. So which one of you would uh, would like to go first? Let Ryan go. Okay. All right. I'll be happy to. Go right ahead. So uh, Ryan Yanis, Silverleaf Leadership Communication. I do leadership training and development uh, for individuals and businesses. Uh, I want to go in and help people become the leader that they need to be to deliver results. And uh, I work with a group called Academy Leadership, which is West Point and Annapolis grads. Uh, I'm one of the non-academy grads that's made it through the wire and, and uh, to become one of our facilitators you have to be successful in the military and in the business civilian world and we bring the business proven military leadership uh, practices techniques and procedures uh, to help people accomplish uh, their missions and, and to make a difference in the world um, we're not trying to make people drill sergeants we're not trying to make them generals those are two very unique skill sets that the military needs uh, but we what we do is focus on the individual and help them to uh, know themselves know their people and know their stuff and it's a very robust uh, platform of engagement that focuses on communication understanding what motivation uh, is is uh, how to best motivate your people uh, how to hold them accountable how to hold yourself accountable and in that, I have a lot of fun working with people and developing. Uh, I'm doing a leadership excellence course in Hoffman Estates in mid-March. It's an open enrollment. We have room at the table for folks to come in and uh, join me. So if you're interested, reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn or Facebook. It's Ryan Yantis. Um, the other thing that I do that I have a lot of fun with is uh, work with veterans and their families in getting their oral histories and sitting down with a World War II vet who's never talked about his or her wartime experience and letting the next generation hear what it is that uh, Uncle Jim did. Wow. Because if Uncle Jim, all he's ever told the family is, goddamn army ruined my life and I served in the Pacific, but it turns out that Uncle Jim had been drafted by the White Sox uh, and then in 1940 got drafted by the army. Uh, so the army won on that draft choice uh, and Uncle Jim ended up playing professional baseball for the Army team in Hawaii against the Navy team. And the Army and Navy team were made up of professional drafted ball players. And, and helping Uncle Jim in his twilight years realize that he had accomplished his goal. He had been a professional baseball player. And that was a really neat, and that was one of my first ones. And then last, as a uh, Pentagon 9-11 survivor, I work with World Trade Center survivors and others, and we... Uh, we are living historical artifacts. We go to schools, we go into groups, uh, churches, public libraries, and uh, we talk about our experience, we share our stories, and we answer questions. Because unfortunately, 
Um, there is a lot of misinformation that's out there, and there are conspiracy theorists um, who peddle their, their wares. And there's a genuine interest, because for the past 17, 18 years, uh, we have been in military action that are a result of 9-11, and uh, helping people understand how and why it got started, uh, that, that's an obligation. So Ryan Yannis, leadership trainer, uh, veteran advocate and oral historian, and then speaker on 9-11. Wow. That, you did that remarkably well. Thank We're you. at uh, uh, 10 2 and 55 seconds. So you've got three seconds left. Anything else? Uh, did not vote for Trump. <laughs> All right. All right. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, turn the, the table over to Jim. Jim, go ahead. You've got three full minutes. All right. So my name is uh, James Martyr or Jim Martyr. I am running for Congress in the 14th Congressional District of Illinois. That's uh, I actually have a crazy map here. You probably won't be able to see it, but McHenry County, which we're in this morning, we got parts of Lake, Kane, Kendall, a bit of Deca half of DeKalb about, um, a little bit of Will and a little bit of DuPage County. So seven counties if you're not keeping track. Um, look, I am, I am the constitutional conservative in this race. I've been in the fight for a number of years now. I've taken on the, the biggest, uh, let's say, disappointment, moderate rhinos in the Republican Party uh, going back to 2016 when I took on Senator Mark Kirk, uh, the only one who would step up to do that. And um, I'm going to join the House Freedom Caucus like my friend, Congressman Jim Jordan. I will stand with President Trump, support the America First agenda, defend our Second Amendment, stand and fight and defend our Second Amendment, uh, respect our flag, defend our Constitution, and I will fight for constitutional and conservative pro-life, pro-family values. I'm for term limits. We're going to build the wall, secure the border, and take care of Washington and cut the size and scope. I will be relentless in pursuing cutting the size and scope of the federal government. So that's kind of my campaign pitch. But I want to talk a little bit about, you know, myself, my family. Um, my wife and I, Jill, have been married 34 years. Um, we, we, we started out on our own. Uh, I think I was 22. She was 21. Moved eight hours away from home from central Illinois. Both grew up in, near Peoria and uh, made, it, made, our, made our first home in Midland, Michigan, where all four of our children were born. Um, some years later, um, moved back to Illinois. And I was an IT guy for the Dow Chemical Company, so um, lear learned my trade there. Great, you know, you know, people like to criticize the corporate world, but, um, you know, they're people, they're, it's, it's made up of people, right, and organizations. Great, great leadership in an organization I had the good fortune to be hired into provided great training for me um, and, and I you know allowed me to be productive for them and do the things they needed to do. I brought those skills back to Illinois in 1997, moved to the village of Oswego, uh, worked for SAP America out of their Chicago office for five years as a software consultant. I still do that today. I left them in 2002 for my own software consulting company and I do that to, to this day. I was actually online last night doing a little uh, IT stuff at about 11:30 to make sure uh, my developer in, in Mumbai was going to get her job done and get the program fixed and sent over here this morning. So, um, believe it or not, you got five seconds. Go. Yep. So anyway, that's just just a quick summary. Uh, you know, I back our president, stand with him 100%, and and uh, Trump 2020. Awesome. All right. Uh, if I can, I want to give Please, kudos right to uh, Jim and uh, the other folks who are actively running for public office. Um, they've got a lot more intestinal fortitude than I do, and I'm a silly son of a bitch who runs into a burning building. So, uh, hats off to them. <laughs> the uh, the scrutiny that they go through and the endless hours of going out and meeting with people and putting themselves forward, uh, that's a great form of uh, love for country and citizenship. It's not self-aggrandizement. Uh, proud to be sitting at the table with him and uh, thankful for his advocacy uh, and, and the other candidates in the 14th. Uh, but, uh, you know, Jim is a very impressive young man. Well, that, so. I'm right there with you on that. It's uh, the, quite frankly, the, uh, and I hope you'll, because I, I, you know what, I'm just going to express it this way because we're not FCC regulated here, <laughs> but uh, the balls that it takes to run for office are brass. If Ooh. not, it's something bigger and firmer and harder. It, it just, it's a scary idea. It's a scary prospect. 
because of exactly what you just said. You're going to go through the ringer like nobody else. Everything you've done, you know, there is a permanent record. Yeah. Yes, in many ways, unless, of course, you you're in certain political families, um, and uh, that there there is a short term memory gap where bad behavior is just whoop, washed over. But uh, you know, if you're a, a, a male who is alive and well in the sexual revolution, you don't dare run for office, especially if you have kids. You know, because anything that was done or said in the past can come back and haunt you. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I look at it also, uh, we talked about, we started the hour talking about the impeachment right. and the, the theater of with, within the beltway of, of our nation capital and what is passing for political uh, conduct and action uh, is just beyond me. I, you know, somebody, who wants to go be part of Congress, you have to really want to try to fix things because it is inherently broken there. Yeah. Um, right, right. Now, the beauty of, and I tongue in cheek and correctly said I didn't vote for Trump, but I've been very, very happy, especially with the, the administration's approach of, okay, if we're going to put in one new regulation, we're going to look at a number to get rid of. And getting rid of, um, some of the overreach of government that's crept up and especially the last 20 years uh, is really helping the economy. It's really helping small business. Uh, there's going to be a tipping point where that becomes not a good thing and they need to be aware of that. But the, the fewer regulations, let grownups be grownups, let right. people do right. their jobs, Amen. create the environment for people to succeed, not to constrain. And, uh, you know, it's it's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, at the um, what's what was going on there, President Trump. Look at the things he's accomplished. He did, he he outlined all these things he said he was going to do, and then he's done them. You know, um, on the regulations, he said two to one. He's done uh, a last I heard it was like twenty two to one regulations they've eliminated. I was at the uh, Trump rally, and it, with all the deplorables, I stood in line in the cold with them, got in. Uh, 10,000 of us at the arena up there and a, and a few more thousand outside in the cold. And, uh, he, you know, President Trump, I mean, this, this man is amazing. Um, he's, what, 73, 74 years old, an hour and a half, and that guy was on fire the whole time. Um, but he talked about, part of one of the things he talked about was the regulations. He talked about one of my favorite pet peeves. He said, you know what, we're going to let people make light bulbs again. Remember the light bulb, you know, Thomas Edison, great American, invented it here, right? <laughs> and uh, we banned them in, what, 2006 or something? And, and that was with Republicans. It was a Republican co-sponsored bill from a congressman in Michigan, and President Bush signed it. I was besides myself back then, and I wasn't even politically active. I was like, what the heck are they doing? You know, this, this is, you know, I'm, and I'm confused, you know, my copy of the Constitution, I'm pr not sure where they got the authority to do that in Washington to ban light bulbs. But there you go. That's what Washington does. He talked, <laughs> he talked about unleashing the dishwasher industry, you know, unleashing the toilet industry. We got regulations coming from oh the federal God. government, all this stuff. Now, the states may have some authority there, but look, folks, we, we need to get Washington out of, out of the business of trying to tell business and smart people that, that study um, they, they learn a lot, engineers, scientists, producers, and let them do their jobs, you know. Yeah, I, I love what you just talked about there because if, if, there, would, if there were to be a single subject voter uh, issue, um, my wife, you just hit on, uh, would be the light bulb thing. Uh, it, it irritates her to no end <laughs> that the, that whole light bulb thing uh, went through. And now you're spending five or six bucks on a freaking light bulb that doesn't last any longer. No than the regular old bulbs that used to be what five cents right yeah. and, and when it goes out it's a it, toxic waste i mean if if you throw it in your trash you're violating epa regulations yeah. folks and and that's what people are doing and then you know you said let's let's uh, deregulate the uh the, the plumbing or toilet industry uh amen that to that whoever came up with the idea of low flow toilets should be slapped in the face in well, in my own personal opinion so uh irony of my life is I uh, was born and raised in California and I fled the People's Republic of California for safety and normalcy of Missouri where I went to college in the 1970s. Where'd you go? University of Missouri, Columbia. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. Um, and 
long story, I ended up in the Army because I wouldn't take a co-ed PE class, not because I don't like co-eds, it just wouldn't work in my schedule. So I ended up taking ROTC in lieu of PE. Uh, and uh, the Army liked me. I liked the Army. They offered me a scholarship, and that's how I started in the Army. But uh, wow. at the end of my career, I'm you know dismounting uh, 22 years of the excuse me, Army, and I'm here in Illinois, another people's republic. <laughs> but yes, California, the uh, with their water insecurity and their inability to do uh, the right kind of planning for uh, systems, they're the ones who invented the low-flow toilets and because it would save and conserve water. And um, they, they pushed it on the agenda. And it's much like the new privacy laws that are coming out of California, with 40 million consumers, they tend to be uh, one of the dominant figures in, mm -hmm. in uh, global commerce. Yeah. So yeah. across the United States, there's this ripple effect of states having to enforce California consumer privacy laws if they want to do business in California. And uh, talking to people who work in that arena where they're trying to unravel, okay, what does this law say? What does it mean? What does it require? And uh, it's stuff that's being decided in cloakrooms in Sacramento. Um, and they don't really know what it means or says. And they're cutting off their own nose because of all the industry uh, in Silicon Valley that's thriving because of uh, you know, the Internet. Yeah. And, and we're watching a situation where the tail is wagging the dog and uh, it's out of balance. Completely. Yeah. I, well, that new the new law they just passed about water usage and how much you can use per person per household per day to the point where now you cannot do a load of laundry and take a shower or do or run your dishwasher right. on, the on the same dang day. Yep. That that's yeah. You, well, but, you know, it's a it's a mess disaster out there. Californians, uh, I love them. They're they're nice people, but they just wake up every morning as a group and say, well, if we had one more law and one more regulation, and if we had just one more ordinance, then everything would be perfect. We would have no bad breath, no hurricanes, <laughs> no earthquakes. Yeah, right. We can just control all this. Right. And if there's any example of a state that has broken itself through the, the load of stupid laws, it's California. Well, maybe you could help them with one of those and just suggest they mandate that every person in California carry a little tin of Altoids. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you know, I'm a yeah. coffee drinker like crazy, and uh, it's not on camera, but I've always got a little <laughs> well, tin uh, in my pocket, always and there, forever. There you go. So, yeah, it, it is amazing out there, right? So, so we we live on a planet that's three quarters covered with water, and yet we're we're regulating ounces and liters and uh, gallons of water that people can use, and and California is. Guess what? They're right on the largest wa body of water on the planet, and they can't figure out how to get water to their people. So well, you and you know the desalinization plants uh, are more viable now than they were yeah. any any previous time in history. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the areas where they would work the best, nope, that's going to inhibit our view of the, the natural environment. So no, you can't have those. <laughs> that's right. And it's that's the right. NIMBY crowd that doesn't do you, want. That's right. Yeah. Do you want something to drink or do you want something to look at? Yeah, What's yeah, more well, important? Right, if you right. have 40 million people who are living in uh, an area that is not water secure. Uh, and meanwhile, Northern California pumps 186,000 mm -hmm. gallons per minute yeah. to the South. Yeah. And so they're draining the North to keep the South uh, alive mm -hmm. and it's you know Los Angeles is basically a big desert basin yeah, um, it absolutely not is. built to support that kind of population <laughs> density so it's it's craziness yeah I, my wife and I had a great trip out there some many years ago but uh, w one of the I was actually out there on business for a couple of days but we put a little vacation on it but we took a, a drive and drove around the, the Angeles National Forest mm -hmm. um, and you know stopped for lunch at, at, at a small town but but it is desert. I mean, it's it's arid, it's dry, but but there's still lots of you know wildlife, you know the desert kind, right? Wildlife and plants and stuff. Sure. But um, so so they built it on a desert, and there you there you go. But you know, I had a business trip, uh, plant in Sagoon, Mexico. Flew into Mexico City. Had drivers take us up to stay in the city of Pachuca, and and you look around that area. There there are places in the countryside where thousands of years ago they had aqueducts. See, they you know that they. Little science and technology goes a long way to solving problems, right? 
Um, and, and, you know, let, let the people, let the scientists and engineers and, and let people work, let them, you know, and construction workers, you know, we, well, let's put some people to work. We can solve some problems. Let them work. Stop, the, get the government out of the business of telling them what they can well, and can't do. You know, and California has been trying for a while to build this high speed train, which has cost a lot of federal tax dollars and has made very little progress. Mm -hmm. uh, but meanwhile, they have not uh, done much to pass any uh, or get any uh, reservoirs built or any water yeah. reclamation to right. catch the rainwater right. that falls. Uh, but they're very much into the environment that we can't inhibit a river. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Or maybe a pipeline from the Pacific Northwest where it doesn't stop raining. You know? I mean, they, maybe they need somebody it. from Japan because yeah. they built the first high-speed bullet train, yeah. what, 60, 60 years ago? Has that, thing been, has that first one been it's running been that long? Time. It's been a long time. Know. Yeah. It, and I thought the first uh, bullet trains were out of Europe, but that's uh, – not not an area of my expertise. And I, the only reason I comment on that, and because you bring up, I happen to be watching um, a James May episode of Our Man in Japan, mm -hmm. and and I enjoy James May. I, I I like all three of those guys, but he does a lot of very informational stuff, and he uh, did a little a short series, uh, of course, on Amazon uh, called James May Our Man in Japan, and one of them was all about. The, the one of the episodes was all about uh, the bullet trains and the train stations, how people get around. Yep. And uh, uh, the very first one over there uh, started running. It was some uh, something around sixty, between fifty and sixty years ago. Well, it, it, it was a, it was a long time. The U.S. Army Air Corps did a great service for Japan in leveling a lot of their cities uh, and creating broad, wide boulevards. Um, uh, you in, in and I'm saying that tongue in cheek. But yeah, I, I, I kind of figured you were. Well, I'm just saying that, sir. Somebody not seeing me on camera. Um, <laughs> Surreptitiously there. When I served in Europe, there were uh, German uh, Rotenberg on their Tauber is a medieval city, and it has a medieval city grid plan and, and narrow, curvy, mm -hmm. you know, non-functional modern, non-modern streets. But you go into parts of Frankfurt, which was heavily bombed, and the streets are level, they're wide, they're straight, um, and they support commerce a whole lot better. Mm. Uh, and that's simply because at the end of World War II, uh, large parts of Frankfurt were... Uh, they were gone. Gone. Yeah. Um, United States and our expansion, if you come from the former 13 colonies and you get out into here in the Midwest where we have the plat map, where it's the one square per mile, and then the, the city townships with the north-south roads, you might have some diagonal uh, uh, roads in there, uh, boulevards cutting through, but you look at towns like Crystal Lake or, or any ubiquitous small town, the Platte system has given us an advantage on uh, our competitors just by having predictive roads that are straight, that are wide, that support traffic. and. Uh, it's very eye-opening to travel in the Midwest with a visitor from Europe where they're going, this road is so straight for so long. How did you do this? Well, you know, we didn't build it on a goat path that, you know, some Roman sheep herder established <laughs> right. in, in the 6th century. Uh, <laughs> and people don't think about that. Yeah. They really yeah. don't. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, one of the things that I was watching on that uh, ruined history show, they were actually talking about uh, the Romans and the Gauls and the final battle mm -hmm. and how uh, Caesar at the time only had 50,000 men yeah. and wound up winning because of some basic Roman engineering mm -hmm. and in building some walls around the Gauls, uh, he defeated over 80,000 inside the wall and another 250,000 outside mm -hmm. the walls just through basic engineering. And so when you don't see that and don't have that experience or that ability, and you come here, just like you said, because I've got, I've got relatives uh, that are in UK. My, my mom and her family didn't come over until she was, I think she was in her early teens. And, uh, but they, you know, they come over here and I'm like, Holy cow. First of all, the United States is insanely huge. You know, they yeah. don't realize that the country of England, when we come combine the rest of the British Isles, it's that's like a small section of the Northeast here. Right. It's they don't realize that the country of England is about the size itself of the state of Wisconsin. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. that, you know, that's just a state. That's just one spot yeah. here. Right. And now you've got the entire rest 
of the country to get through. They think they're going to come over and in a week they're going to, you know, hop around and they're going to go from New York down to Texas up to Los Angeles and see Hollywood, come back over, hit Chicago. Uh, No, that's not happening in a week. You know, especially if you want to spend a couple days or a day or two in each one of those, not happening. Uh, but, uh, it, 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 yeah, it is interesting. It is unique. Well, we, we went, um, we're, we're coming up on, uh, uh, just about the, uh, 10 25 mark here, giving us about five minutes left this morning. And, uh, we've gone from impeachment all the way to civil engineering. There you go. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> but, uh, but that's, that's kind of, uh, I, I, I really enjoy having the two of you here as new guests to civil tension, because even though this is essentially episode number 91, this has been very typical civil tension, uh, even though we've taken about a six month break here and uh, glad to be back with it uh, and uh, would encourage anyone who wants to be a part of this to reach out. You can either send a note to um, civil tension at gmail.com. Or you can send a note to 216thenet at gmail.com. Or you can send a note to Pete at 216thenet.com. Our plan is to run Civil Tension uh, every Friday right now, 9.30 to 10.30. That uh, might be a little bit of a time change and maybe a day change we might work with. Uh, see what works with people to get into the studio. We may try uh, a different morning. We may even try an evening. Uh, but uh, whatever works, let me know, and we'll work with your schedule. But shoot me a note, and I'll send you the details on how you can join us here. Uh, giving us, uh, again, right right around the, the five-minute mark here, um, is there anything on your minds that you that we didn't touch on in this broad space? Or do you have final thoughts on that? Because I think they're doing a vote at midnight tonight. With regard to the impeachment process, I got to confess, yeah. um, I have kind of kept a carrier wave of, of interest in it, mm-hmm. but I have not been able to stomach sitting and I listening haven't either. to it. I, one, I'm trying to earn a living and, and uh, being responsible, uh, and the breathless reporting um, uh, on the news is. Um, they're trying to sell uh, their airtime in advertising mm-hmm. and trying to make something that is inherently boring interesting. Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, you know, I, I think shame on uh, Ms. Pelosi, uh, Mr. Schiff, Mr. Nadler, and uh, that the Democratic leadership of the House for if you want to imp- impeach somebody, you take the best case you can uh, and don't do it when it's not. Uh, right or time and they have squandered a any opportunity to have um any real meaningful impact on this president uh, by throwing this crap together and so haphazardly um and if that's what passes for leadership and decisiveness on their side of the aisle uh, they're in very sad shape and it, it's grasping at, at straws they they don't have anything that's right look look i I can't i haven't watched much of it either i'm uh, campaigning 24 7 while i'm working making a living at the same time (laughs) and uh, i just can't stand to look at adam shifty shiftless's face anymore so um but but look i mean lauren underwood was with them all the way she voted for this right i delivered a letter to her west chicago office um back in december uh, a few days after she she had her vote and it's a complete sham. It's um, what they're doing with the process. It, it's never been done like this before where the president can't bring his own witnesses. Um, they, they have a fake, phony um, whistleblower, as they call him, that we've never seen her. I think there's something in the Constitution about you have a right to a speedy trial and facing your facing your accusers. And where, innocent until proven guilty. And innocent yeah. until proven guilty. How many senators, how many... How many Congress people have come out this week and said he's he's got to prove himself innocent now? So now we flip the tables on the Constitution and our, our right, right to be protected from that tyrannical government that we just talked about throwing off a couple hundred years ago. So, Well, and I'm here in McHenry County, and I tend to be right of center. And I have an interest in learning about the politicians that are running for office. And I've met Jim, and I've met many of the other candidates. I'm impressed uh, Lauren Underwood has never m- deigned to come out here as far as I know. Um, the only communication I received from her was some BS about 
a veterans event that had no applicability to me uh, and it was mislabeled and I, I was not identified correctly. Um, so she doesn't resonate with me. She's not my representative. She hasn't represented me. So mm -hmm. um, I encourage anybody, regardless of the side of the aisle, get busy, get informed, uh, come out and sit in on uh, <laughs> this program if you want to talk. That's right. We, we need to replace L Lauren Underwood, Illinois 14 district. You know, this is a district Republicans actually held 46 of the last 50 years. Um, look, I, I don't think that this district is a Chicago style district. I think people are going to wake up this cycle. They're going to come out. They're going to vote in droves. They understand we have the greatest economy we've had in a long, long time under President Trump, his leadership, even despite all of this nastiness that's been attacking him. But, but really, you know what? It's not attacking him. It's attacking us. If, if you believe in liberty, if you believe in our constitution, if you believe in free government, the ability to get up in the morning and work hard and make a living, that's what's under attack. And when they're attacking him, they're attacking me, they're attacking you, and they're attacking everyone out here. And so we need to take Congress back. We need to take it back now. We don't have time to wait for another cycle. Uh, I really appreciate your passion. I really do. It's, and, and I want to be very clear on this, and we're, we're, we're just about a minute and a half out for wrapping up. On civil tension, this table is open to anyone who wants to sit at it and uh, who, 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 you know, shells out their ticket fee at the door. Uh, but uh, you do get, uh, you know, if there are, are six people total, because we can, we can squeeze six people in, uh, you do get a full minute to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about, so long as it's legal, like we mentioned. I don't care if you're on the right, on the left. I don't care where you stand. And I think that might be because, because like the two of you, I'm, I'm more right of center than probably than, than other people. Uh, but I think that inherently means we're a little more open. My experience has been that means we're a little more open into listening to whatever it is you feel impassioned about. And we'll make our own judgment on that. You know, if you bring facts to the table and, and present those facts, um, and I've had people say, well, no, I don't want to come on because you only argue based on facts. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 from, from what I, everything I've learned, that tells me how you do it. Now, I do understand that people argue from emotion, and there is such a thing as emotional uh, intelligence, and uh, we li we're emotional creatures. Humans right. simply are. That, that's what we are. That's part, a big part of what makes us human. Is, is emotion uh, and you there's no way to avoid that and you really shouldn't but you know come on and it, the table's open to anybody really so again send a note pete at 216 the net the net the net not the nut the net the net dot com <laughs> yeah pete the nut uh but you're on civil tension when you're right you're right uh gentlemen thank you again so much for being on the return of civil tension episode 91 uh the first one back so thank you guys very much and you can wave yourselves out if you like all right there we go